the genesis of the movement to win this particular ordinance around caste discrimination started three years ago when there was a movement against the CAA and RC. If you are a dominant caste person who is not perpetrating discrimination on oppressed caste people, then you have nothing to fear from this law. We had support from Amnesty International USA, from Arundhati Roy, Noam Chomsky, Cornell West, and also from Ashwini KP, who is based in Bangalore, who is the special United Nations Special Rapporteur. Discrimination based on caste is now illegal under Seattle law. From my earliest memories, as far back as I can remember, I was extremely preoccupied with political questions. And I and I when I say political, I don't mean elected office or elections. I mean political questions about the world around us and why the world is structured in this way, why there is poverty, why should there be misery. So from the very beginning, for me, the most compelling, and it was it was a very intellectual position also that for, for me it was a very compelling thought that surely. This is not the best that humanity can achieve. Surely we can do better. I did not come from a political family. I had no nobody political around me actually. And so I had no outlet. I was in, in this, in the political sense, I was very isolated and alone. And again, as I said, it might it might resonate with a lot of people. It's not there's nothing unique about my experience, but I uh, so I I I grew up in a in a family, many of whom are academics or engineers, and I grew up loving mathematics and I loved that subject. But I never had a I never had a passion for any career. In fact, I I did not know. I'm, I'm, I guess I would have miserably failed if I had to build a professional career on, on that basis, on the basis of professional qualifications, because I never had a passion for it. Uh, but I went along in, the, in that route in, in terms of becoming an engineer, because that was the only thing that I could do. And of course, you have to earn a living as well. So, you know, I was doing that. But throughout that period, what I was preoccupied with was not building my professional career, but uh, with, uh, I was preoccupied with finding intellectual answers for my burning questions. When I came here, I, I had an I, I had a certain idea that well, I don't expect things to be perfect, but I still would think that. In the richest country in the history of humanity, you surely many of the endemic problems you see in a neo-colonial country like India, which has been impoverished by uh, years of imperialism, but also then years of subjugation by the uh, very corrupt state and, and those factors, that things would be significantly better here. And of course they are. I mean, it would be ludicrous to think that things in the United States are the same as in India. They're not, obviously not. However, what was astounding to me was to see how even in a wealthy society, some of the most basic needs for tens of millions of American working people are not covered. The way the caste discrimination phenomenon manifests itself in the United States is uh, for the most part, and, and it's not, by no means the only way, but the, for the most part, the most prominent way that we can see it is in the workplace. So for example, we've seen hundreds of oppressed caste tech workers, you know, Dalit and other oppressed caste tech workers speak up. We have seen a, a, a very important letter written by 30 the anonymously written by 30 Dalit women software engineers, which was published in the Washington Post, in which they talked about the serious discrimination that they faced, even including sexual harassment. But it's also a daily dose of the, the derogatory remarks, slurs constantly targeted at oppressed caste individuals. You know, the interests of Indian billionaires, even if they may have the same skin color as you, 
are diametrically opposed to the interests of you as an Indian worker. Your interests as an Indian working class person are tied with the interests of working class people everywhere. Similarly, the interests of white workers in the United States are not tied with Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates. They are tied with working people everywhere. If workers or the oppressed win a victory anywhere, it's a victory for working people everywhere. So that's why it's not surprising and it's also extremely gratifying and heartening to me that the victory that we have won here has captured the imagination of millions of people everywhere, especially in India. Discrimination based on caste is now illegal under Seattle law. And the principal mechanism that this law offers is if you're an oppressed caste worker who are facing caste discrimination at the hands of your dominant caste bosses, then you can go to court using this law and sue the corporation where you're experiencing this discrimination. And really in many ways, the genesis of the movement to win this particular ordinance around caste discrimination started three years ago when there was a movement against the CANRC, the, the citizenship laws by Modi. In fact, at that time, organiza local organizations like the Indian American Muslim Council, the Coalition of Seattle Indian Americans, which united Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs and, and Dalit leaders as well, together alongside Socialist Alternative and my office. And at that time, we won a resolution condemning the CANRC. The premise uh, of the right-wing arguments is that there is no caste discrimination, but that is a falsehood. You know, you have statistical data about it, and you have the testimonials of hundreds, if not thousands, of people who are describing this. And at the end of the day, if 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 you know, the right-wing always as they always start by saying, "Well, I'm opposed to discrimination, but we don't need this law." Well, my response to them is, "If you're opposed to dis discrimination, then why do you oppose a law that opposes discrimination?" You know, it's as simple as that. The only people who would oppose a law against discrimination are people who believe in the discrimination. To say that protecting Dalit or, you know, oppressed caste Indian Americans against discrimination would somehow target Indian Americans as a whole or Indian Americans from other castes, that's like saying addressing racism against black and brown people would negatively affect white people. Uh, when they talk about, uh, you know, like, how do you determine cash? How do you enforce this law? These are all falsehoods because this is nothing new. I mean, just to give you an example, the Seattle anti-discrimination law already prohibits discrimination on the basis of age, gender, sexual orientation, uh, all of those characteristics. So uh, if, if somebody is facing LGBTQ-based discrimination and discrimination because they're gay or LGBTQ otherwise, it's not like the law is uh, re required to identify them in some way. These, those are self-identified characteristics. An LGBTQ person, the law in Seattle, gives an LGBTQ person the right to go to court and say, I am LGBTQ and I have faced discrimination because of being LGBTQ and here's the evidence. Caste-based discrimination law will, will, will work in exactly the same way. Uh, the fact that you have Nikki Haley and Vivek Ramaswamy running as right-wing candidates is an important and even I would, I would say grim reminder of the deep failures of identity politics, postmodernism, and inter intersectionality. These kinds of ideas, because they they are South Asian, they are of South Asian origin, like me, but. What they represent is the interests of the billionaire class, not to mention they are a reminder of how we cannot look at the identity of a, a, a person, a leader or leading figure, but look at the class interests that they represent, what their class allegiances are, which side they're actually on. And it can tell you that you can be from the exact same origin and represent diametrically opposed interests. Every time I visit 
I have this deep longing, this, 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 this deep desire to just live there and not come back to the U.S. But at the same time, I also have ties in the United States. So I feel like I have a dual home between the United States and India. And I, I do feel a powerful solidarity with ordinary people in India, with the working class in India. And I'm really uh, just on a personal level as a socialist and as a person who hails from India, I, I'm just especially gratified that this ordinance has caught the attention of so many people in India because I, I, you know, I feel like if this can offer any message of hope for building a fight back inside India, which is much harder, you know, it is, it's much easier to be against the Modi regime in the United States. It's much harder to be in India and building movements uh, against the right wing and against the billionaire class.